like I've always said that our daughters would be safe if our sons are raised right and that really matters if you don't have any hope or any optimism for the future of any kind it changes your psychology and it's not just about gender uh, or crime against gender it's just crime period forever whether it was a touch or a word or a molestation or rape it happens and it's just i mean there is no way of dealing with it honestly netflix india's series delhi crime has won an international emmy this is fabulous news and has recognized one of the best made in my opinion takes on sexual violence it is of course set against the backdrop of the nirbhaya gang rape a gang rape that occupied our headlines caught our attention we thought would change our country the jury is still out on that one but in the telling of the nirbhaya case delhi crime has now won accolades on the global stage picking up as i said an international emmy on this special series where we talk to change makers who have made a difference to the rights of women it is my pleasure to welcome to the program the female voice shifali shah and richi mehta the creator of the series it's particularly joyous for me as a feminist to be talking to a man who's created such an impeccable piece of work uh, when it comes to talking about sexual violence and mainstreaming that conversation thank you both and first like a really gigantic congratulations you must be thrilled Uh, out of your mind chefali i know you've been describing it as this sort of life changing um, career moment uh, but i'm sure given that i know a little bit about what you feel and what you're about it's also the work that it's been recognized for that i'm sure is making a difference right it is uh, in fact this one goes to the entire team it, it, it this could not delhi crime could not have been possible without every single person who was a part of creating it and uh, i just feel so proud and honored to be a part of a show like this and yes emmy is a reinforcement and all the international awards we've gotten before are a reinforcement of what we believed in uh, but even before that the first time she met me and i said this is something i want to do this is something i believe in and that was every single day i went on set Yeah. So yes this is a winning uh, position that we have now but for me it's always been a winner it's always been extremely special and and i will uh, talk a little bit more about what uh, you know what it meant to you uh, at at the deepest level of being a woman who cares about uh, these issues and we all do but richi why this story why the nirbhaya story and you know i've read uh, and heard many versions of it uh, there's neeraj kumar who was uh, sort of in police force at the time who basically says that he was prevailing upon you to tell the story you were a bit sort of wary uh, and then you spent years researching it and it took you years before you decided you wanted to tell the story so there is the obvious story and then there was your need to tell it in the way that you have in delhi crime what was the journey like for you personally so you you've um correctly identified the the mechanisms by which i found the story um uh, but there there's there's two aspects to it one is as a man being in delhi at the time when this happened and seeing the the confusion and you know the the if information disseminated over several days there was rumors none of us were sure the first two days what was actually happening and then it spiraled um the, the, i couldn't help but think as a from my point of view uh, on this crime you, you trying to find a point of relation to it and all i could think of is um if i'm walking down the street late night one night and i see something like this happening some sort of sexual assault against somebody what do i do do i w- turn the other way and run away because i don't want to get involved in this in which case i probably couldn't live with myself knowing what it was the other side of it is do i intervene in which case it could be the end of my life too and this it was like a medusa thing of you, one just hopes they don't ever see it because it will alter their life but then this happened and we we all in a way we all saw it there was nothing we could do we couldn't unsee it and it was it's a very complicated relationship because for me i can't relate 
to the male psyche that would lead to something like this, the aggression. On the other hand, there's no way I could ever relate to the victimization aspect of it. I, I don't know what that is. I can try and empathize. Then this lands on me. And, um, and Neeraj Kumar was, was very wise about this. He said, look, you find your way into it. And as I started meeting these cops, um, everyone kept pointing to Chaya Sharma. Everyone kept saying, no, no, no. I would meet with them. I would talk to them, see them for days and days and days. And they say, no, 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 but you must meet Chaya Sharma. Eventually I landed on Chaya Sharma's doorstep. And then I got to see really what was happening from the point of view of this woman. Because this was now one woman who reacted as a human being would and should, but then was also empowered to do something about it. It, it, could, it could just, it, it wouldn't um, translate into handcuffing emotions that would lead them to, to personal frustration and sleepless nights. It was, I can actually do something. And then I, I started to see, wait a sec, it's not that you can actually do something, you did something. And you did something which I would deem as superhuman. And the people under you followed you. And the women all involved in this, in my view, were superhuman. That started to lead me down this path. And I realized if this story has to be told, it must be told from the point of view of the women who empowered themselves to change it. You know, I want to ask you whether it changed your understanding of sexual violence. And I ask you this because even very enlightened, well-meaning, well-intentioned feminist men, uh, frankly, don't get it. Sure. You had to create the show and you had to tell the story and you tell the story from the point of view of multiple women, whether it was, you know, Chaya as, 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 as played by Shafali or, uh, you know, Jyoti's mother, Nid, you know, Jyoti, whom we knew as Nidbhaya, till her mother said, I want my daughter to be known by her name and so on. Did it change your understanding as a guy? Yeah. Yeah, did it, it did. Did it challenge your assumptions? It did, because it, what it did was, it wasn't just a, a, a me as a guy saying, oh, those are other crazy psychopathic guys who are doing this. That's not me. I could never get to that stage. Mm -hmm. um, what it did, what it changed in me is I realized that we all are playing a part in this. There's a complacency, um, which relates to, there's, there's a section in, in, in the series where I have one character in a car at night driving with another character and the, and the guy says, you know, so why do you think this happens? And he, and he goes, oh, it's simple. And he gives this list of things, which any cop you speak to, especially the women, were listing off to me. Economic disparity, gap between the rich and the poor, um, unemployed men uh, who are uneducated. Uh, and it just kept going, going, going. And then, you know, it, for them, it became a, a availability uh, and access to uh, certain types of pornography. It was all kinds of things that started to, to come in. And then I realized, wait, these are not, each individual reason has something to do with me. I'm, I'm living in this society. I, rela I relate to economic disparity. I, rela I was a guy who was unemployed. I didn't have anything, any future. I didn't have any hope of the concept of a future. I didn't have a meal to look forward to tomorrow. If you don't have any hope or any optimism for the future of any kind, it changes your psychology. Mm -hmm. That's yet, when I start to understand that's what can create these demons. Yeah, but yet it's complicated because sexual violence, uh, Shafali, as we know, prevails across uh, classes. Uh, it prevails across yes. cities. It prevails across geographies. It's actually a universal uh, phenomenon. And it's one of those, uh, those things that actually transcends culture, class, caste, yes. everything. Uh, you know, Shifali, one of the first uh, stories I did as a journalist, I was, in my, I was like a kid in my 20s, and I, I went to cover the story of the gang rape of a Dalit woman called Bhavri Devi. And she'd been gang raped by so-called upper caste men for trying to stop the child marriage of a one-year-old. And among the rapists was, her was the kid's father. Right. And it's been more than two decades and this woman has still not got justice. The reason I shared this story, Shifali, is I read somewhere you said you would kill your children if they were to ever turn on somebody and hurt them with violence, with abuse. But the point is, it must be every parent's worst nightmare that no matter what I do, what if, what if my children or somebody I care about or somebody I like or a friend becomes a perpetrator of this kind of violence. Maybe not this kind of the kind we saw in the Nirbhaya case, but of some other kind. These are ongoing conversations in our lives. Yeah, very true. And uh, it is a fear. I mean, uh, as a mother, as a parent, I've always said that you don't know how good or bad have you done your job until they're much older, until they're 30 and they're on their own and they're going to be their own people. But uh, I also have said, like Rishi was saying, that, you know, it's not just a responsibility 
of the education system or the social system or the government, but it's a individual responsibility. So how I raise my sons, uh, like I've always said that our daughters would be safe if our sons are raised right. And that really matters. And it's not just about gender mm -hmm. uh, or crime against gender. It's just crime, period. I mean, how you raise your children matters a lot. How, what are the dynamics of the family? You know, whether you talk about patriarchy or you just talk about misogyny or you talk about how men are given a higher standard than women are, uh, even in today's time, in different households. So it's, it, it starts from home. And that's how it's going to grow outward rather than just sitting there and saying, okay, you all change around and then we'll see what we can do. Talk a, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I always think of this word nirbhaya, which means fearless without fear, and how we foisted this absence of fear on this extraordinary family, you know, and for anybody who doesn't know the parents of this girl, they, 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 they sort of do everything, they, they sell land, they do everything to give their daughter an opportunity to dream, and then they spend the next many years fighting for justice for their daughter. And yet the fact that you know, we can't call her by her name, that we must insist that she's fearless, that we must put her on this pedestal because God forbid, you know, that we talk about pain and, and damage and, and recovery. You know, there are so many contradictions even in, in, in the reality of how we look at rape survivors, right, Shepali? Uh, and I got, I got to know um, Nirbhaya's mother quite well. And I would keep saying to her, Ki, dekhi, you know, the, the contradiction of our society is that we're everyone's eulogizing your daughter, but we, the stigma around rape is so much that we don't even call her by her name. And that's when she actually said, Meri beti ka naam Jyoti hai. my daughter's name is Jyoti. Please remember her as Jyoti. She was a person. This stigma, how, you know, in your sort of research for this series or for, for Delhi crime, how did you deal with and understand this stigma? Is that for me? Or is yes. She... Well, I'd like both of you to talk about it. You can go first, Shepali. Uh, one is that what happened at that point of time, Barkha, left a scar on us. And that's a scar that's never going to heal. Uh, while I stood in the DCP's shoes, while there was a sense of some kind of justice, uh, having a certain sense of empowerment to be actually uh, solving the crime, at the same time, as a woman, as a person, I just felt completely broken, even if I hadn't done the shit. And yes, you're right, there is a stigma attached to it. And then when somebody like Nirbhaya's, uh, Jyoti's mom comes up and says, this is my daughter. And yes, you know, very correctly, you just named her Nirbhaya. Yeah. Without any fear, for God's sake, do you even know what she went through? I mean, what we needed to acknowledge, uh, which we completely, I think what happened with the name given was the pain and the agony and the vulnerability and the, the, just the breaking of a human being in life got diversed into something else which became so larger than life and so, uh, you know, fearless. How, can, how, how could that even be possible? It's not even real. Exactly. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's, it's so unfair. And, and, and yet, Richie, without that somewhat, like I, I, I want to say the word mythologization, I don't know if that's the correct word, but without that elevation, maybe this story would not have, or this tragedy or this horror would not have meant as much as it came to mean to so many people. So it was almost like this collective transfer of rage and anxiety and hope onto this one person and this one family. And I, I'm just wondering how you see that, Richie. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree with that because you're talking about the, the, the broader social implications of what happened after and the fact that it's lingering in people's collective memory. Um, I think, I know for me, what, what set me off was when I read the medical reports yeah. and realized, wait a second, how, how, can a human being do this to somebody else? How, what, how is that even possible? Um, and when I started writing it, I was very um, conscious about the fact that I was taking a certain point of view, which was I would get parse information um, in the manner that these police officers, especially the, the Vartika character, was learning it. So if she didn't see it, we didn't really know it. Um, but the, uh, what I tried to do with, even with the character, who we call Deepika in the, in the, in the series, um, we're not spending a lot of time with them before 
the case begins, but I was adamant of that we see them coming out of the movie theater because that's all of us. That person coming down the escalator is all of us. And if, and if we, I even went to painstaking detail, if you hear it in a certain type of sound system, you're gonna hear the details of Life of Pi that they're discussing. They're her viewpoints on the tiger as she comes down the thing. These are, this is, we've had, all had these conversations. We've all come out of the movie and had this conversation. And then they get into the rickshaw and then everything changes. And yet the fact is she was somebody's daughter. She was somebody's sister. She has her own complete life and complete story. And wherever I could, I would try to imply that as much as possible because these are not myths. Yeah. This is, these are literally people. Every single person deserves their, their full, full story. I want to ask both of you, uh, has anything changed? Do you think, like we changed, we changed as people, we changed in our understanding of, of, of violence and abuse. Uh, the rape laws changed, but have we really changed? Richie, do you think we've changed? No, the cynical side of me says we haven't. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the statistics, they can be argued either way. Or is it, are more people reporting it, therefore they're going up. Population densities are increasing in urban environments, therefore it's going up. Um, the disparity economically is increasing. I don't think we've actually changed. Certainly the, pub, the, the mainstream consciousness of the people who watch your programming has changed. This discussion is happening every week and it's on the yeah. forefront. It's certainly on my mind every day. Um, have we really addressed what toxic mas masculinity means? The, the depth and the weight of what actually goes into that? I don't think so. I mean, I, Shifali, I, I think toxic masculinity is, is, is everywhere, right? It's, it doesn't actually take a rape for it to manifest itself. You work uh, in an industry where if it weren't maybe for OTT platforms like Netflix, uh, the kind of sexism, subliminal or otherwise, the kind of battles that I think women have to fight, especially in vanity industries. I can't even begin to imagine it. Uh, honestly, it's, you know, the, the industry that I'm a part of uh, has a face it's out there, uh, doesn't mean the same kind of sexism or uh, unfair behavior doesn't have, uh, happen elsewhere. It's just that it's more in the forefront. Like Rishi very correctly, uh, correctly said, that is it because it's reported more or is it because it's continuing to grow? So there are these two things that uh, are an aspect to it. Um, I have been lucky. I have been really lucky to not face something like this, but forget the industry. I remember being groped as uh, in a market and feeling humiliated and just feeling like, I just felt like, oh my God, what wrong did I do? You know, why did, why was I made a victim of it? And thank God I didn't, uh, uh, you know, I didn't have to face something as brutal as a lot of women do today. But I think when you look back and you say, when you look back, I, I remember this distinct uh, conversation I had when I was doing Monsoon Wedding and when it released and everyone who saw it and there were friends and there were just people who I met and they said it was a catharsis because it's happened, but no one spoke about it. Yeah. You know, so it, it was, so it's been happening forever, whether it was a touch or a word or molestation or rape, it happens. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, there is no way of dealing with it, honestly. No, and, the, and the flip side, Shafali, is that tough women, I, I identify myself as one, we train ourselves to not be impacted by this. It's like boot camp version of sexual abuse. It's happened in buses, it's happened in public spaces, it's happened in families, it's happened inside the circle of trust. And we think we're strong because we outlive it without asking why we have to live it at all. Absolutely. And the fact that, I mean, you know, uh, again, like I met somebody yesterday and uh, this person I met said, thank you so much. You, you healed me with monsoon wedding. And I was like, that's, I mean, I, I didn't do anything. But the fact is that it started a conversation. Why does it have to be behind closed doors? And if you don't make other people aware of it, whether it's in your family or your circle, you're not letting yourself heal completely. You're not actually catching the person responsible for it and putting a gun on that person's head. 
So it's like, let's not, let's pretend like it never happened. Yeah. That is what a lot of us did. A lot of, a lot of families do, a lot of women do. Don't ask, don't tell, right? And that's why whether it's monsoon wedding or dairy crime, these are such important tales. But, you know, uh, the data tells you that more than 90% of Indian women who experience sexual violence know the man who's attacked them. So in that way, yes, Nirbhaya was, or, you know, and, and the story that Delhi Crab is based on was an outlier. But Richie, this kind of, this kind of abuse, uh, violence is power. Violence is the assertion of hierarchy. Uh, violence is the assertion of a man's place in society and a woman's place. Uh, this is everywhere. This is in our lives. This is sometimes in our romantic relationships. This is sometimes in our marriages. This is sometimes with our fathers, uh, you know, Eve Ensler, vagina monologues. This is everywhere. Uh, I, I want you to share something with me personally as a man, specifically, not the macro narrative, um, that you used to think that you now no longer think in the growing up and the telling of the story. Ooh, I need a second for that one, if you don't mind. Sure, because I can, you know, I think what I'm trying to really say is that we all change, right? And exposure yeah. to extreme trauma and conflict changes us. I find as a journalist, my assumptions are challenged all the time. For example, I used yep. to like saying I don't believe in caste. And then I understood that caste informs how women experience sexual violence, just to give you an That's example. That's right. So, you know, what's I can give you an one, one thing that you, that you I, know? I'll give you an example. And yeah. this was a learning I got from the show, which changed my whole viewpoint on society. Uh, and it relates to the Lord of the Flies, the idea mm -hmm. of the Lord of the Flies. You take a bunch of young boys, put them on an island, and they're going to become savage and start killing each other for power games, like a kindergarten class, unsupervised, which is what I believed in. And then when I would speak to these cops, and over time, I started asking the most important question at the end of each interview, which was, do you still believe in people? And that question was usually, um, it, it usually preceded them giving me a, a story of a heinous crime, which is incomprehensible. And then I would say, do you still believe in people? And every cop would say, yes, of course I do. So how is that possible? You just found a two-year-old in a dumpster. How do you believe in, in the goodness of human beings? And they would give me those statistics that, oh, we have you know, 80,000 police officers for 20 million people in Delhi and 45% are used for VIP protection and traffic duty. So, so that leaves 55% of 80,000 to, to do preventive policing. We cannot stop a crime from being committed statistically. If, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Um, we can detect and apprehend if the circumstance is correct which means the only thing keeping the peace are the people themselves. The, the, all of order you see in society are people wanting to do that. And that completely changed the paradigm for me where I said, wait a sec, if, if that's the situation and it makes sense, then the math checks out, then inherently the majority of us actually do want to do good. We do want to live a civil society. What we're talking about, and they're not outliers, it's a, it's an, it's a pandemic what we're talking about, this, yeah. these issues but it's still the minority. The majority still wants to do the right thing and make things better. And that then propelled me forward. Otherwise I would have said, what's the point of me doing yeah. this show? Yeah, I, well, I'm so glad you did the show. I'm so glad Shafali played uh, Chaya. I'm so glad that we have mainstreamed, uh, you know, uh, these subjects that were once taboo, that once belonged in the realm of keep it under wraps uh, into now, uh, you know, consuming it actually almost as contemporary culture. And that's so important because the roots of the roots of this violence are in our culture. We're culturally programmed to look at men and women in some ways. And so it will take culture to challenge it. Uh, I'm being told we're out of time. So I have to say a huge congratulations, how proud we all are of both of you, how much we love Delhi crime and stay strong and keep telling the stories that really matter and really make people uncomfortable because that's what it's all about. Thank you guys. Thank you, Barkha.